Amen. So, I'm super excited because we continue with our new series titled Psalms for the Journey. If you've been tracking with us, you know that we're calling it this way because there's a little feedback there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We're calling it this way because we're meditating on a very interesting selection of songs. You know, songs basically are songs you can actually sing, and people in the, back in the day would sing these songs. And so there's a very interesting selection of songs, Psalms 120 through 134, that the people of Israel would sing along their way, their journey out of their captivity from Babylon back home to Jerusalem. And that was good news, except for the fact that Jerusalem was destroyed. It was in ruins. Also, the journey, the road was dangerous, was long. It was a 900 miles walk. And back in the day, as you can imagine, there was no Uber, no lift, right? Walk. Walking 900 miles. Can you imagine that picture? Very hot, right? Very dangerous, very heated. Actually, something interesting, if you like details, the Jewish people still do this pilgrimage walk once a year in Israel. Jewish people from all over the world go to uh, Israel and they do this pilgrimage walk towards Jerusalem. Another interesting fact is that every time you walk to Jerusalem, it's an uphill road. That's why these Psalms are called the Psalms of Ascent. You probably have that in your Bibles. You can see that all these Psalms says Psalm of Ascent. Because they're, they're walking uphill. So hot, dangerous, uphill, you name it. Very hard journey. Now, why is this important for us? It's because as we've been reflecting over the last few weeks, the journey of life can also be hard. Amen? Can I have a witness for that? Amen. Can get heated, can be dangerous, can be hot, <laughs> can be uphill. And the same way that the Jewish people sang these songs along, along their journey to be reminded about God's promises, about God's protection and provision for their lives, we need reminders throughout the journey of life about God's provision, about God's protection. Amen? So that's why these songs are important. Do, do you have a reminder in your life? Do you, do you do certain things on a daily basis to remind your heart, to remind your soul about God's promises to you? That's why it is important to be in the Word daily. That's why it is important to come to church every week, to be reminded about God's promises to us, amen? That's why it's so powerful to be just listening to worship songs as we are driving around, as we are doing our errands on a daily basis. That's why it's so important. So, with that context in mind, today we're going to be meditating on Psalms 131. If you can open your Bibles, turn them on, track along with us. You know how we roll around Axis. We basically just break down the scriptures verse by verse. Sometimes entire books of the Bible, sometimes just selected scriptures as we are doing it today. And we just let the word speak by itself. Amen? So if you track along with us, it's you're gonna get the most out of it. Because as Sarah said, you're probably just gonna remember 10% of what I say today. But your Bible, you're gonna have it with you every day. If you go to this Psalm on Wednesday, you're gonna remember the promises of God in the Psalm. What's important is the word, it's not my ideas, amen? I want you to remember these promises. That's what God wants for us. So, let's jump into it. Psalms 131. King David 
wrote this song. Oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great, too marvelous for me. Verse two, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a winged child with its mother. Like a winged child is my soul within me. O Israel, you can put your name there. O Christian, O Robert, O Margaret, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Beautiful song. And I want to propose to you that what we are going to be learning from this beautiful song is about peace for our soul. You see, the big question the psalmist is dealing with is how to reach quietness for our soul. Have you ever asked that question to yourself? I think it's a very important question nowadays. We live in a world, we live in a society that is always in a hurry. It is always, it makes us always feel stressed out, concerned about tomorrow, concerned about our finances, concerned about our bills, concerned about our children, concerned about so many things, and we need peace. Amen? Somebody here need peace? I don't know about you, but I need peace. I need peace in my heart. My brain sometimes doesn't stop. And I'm like, Lord, I need peace. The problems in your life will never stop. Did you know that? The journey of life is heated, dangerous, long, hard. How do we do that? How do we reach peace for our souls? When we think about the concept of peace, oftentimes we think about absence of problems. Actually, the word peace comes from the Latin word pax, which means absence of war. But I love how the Bible redefines concepts. The Bible teaches us that the peace of the Lord doesn't have anything to do with absence of problems. It doesn't have anything to do with absence of war. There's always war. There's battle going on. In the spiritual realm also, it's never stopping for now. Peace, according to the scriptures, has to do with quietness of the soul. As a result of being secure and satisfied in the Lord. Those are our two key words for our meditation this morning. Uh, let me say that again. Biblical peace or the peace of the Lord comes to our souls when we learn to be secure and satisfied in Him. In a nutshell, what we're going to learn from this beautiful psalm is this. True peace, biblical peace, the peace from the Lord is the result of being fully secure, is the result of being fully satisfied in Him. Amen? Now, as we explained a couple Sundays before, when we learn and meditate on these psalms, it's very important to take into consideration that these psalms have a backstory and a front story. Meaning these psalms weren't written right there and then, when the Jewish people were journeying back to Jerusalem. They have a backstory. They were written beforehand. In this case, Psalm 131 was written by King David as he was going through a very pivotal time in his life. As he was learning to be secure and satisfied in the Lord. So, from this beautiful psalm, I want to suggest to you we're going to learn at least two simple but vital shifts 
God wants us to experience in our souls so we can experience his peace, so we can experience quietness for our souls. The first shift that needs to take place in our hearts and in our minds is to trade our ambitions for God's provision. What I mean by that is that we have to stop pursuing the desires of our hearts, the desires of our flesh as the main driver of our lives. And we have to learn to be content and secure in God's provision. Amen? That's exactly what the psalmist is telling us. Verse 1 in your Bibles. Oh Lord, he starts, my heart is not lifted up my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. You see, King David is using the word occupy here in the sense of dwelling on, being controlled by, dominated, consumed by the things of this world, things that are too great for me, things that are above my head. I have stopped lifting my eyes to my ambitions, to the things that are too far above my head. Why is he saying this? Because once in his, li in his life, he was consumed and controlled, driven by pursuing his ambitions. He was living out the movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, right? Have you watched that movie, by the way? It's really cool. One of the premises is, you know, I like when, when this guy, uh, Chris Gardner, Gardner is the main author representing, it's a true story. He's, he's reflecting about, man, I'm pursuing all these things, I'm pursuing happiness based on what's written in the Constitution of the United States, and he then reflects, hey, hold on. Did Jefferson and the rest of the guys who wrote you know, the Constitution, why did they include the word pursue in there? Did they actually knew that happiness is something you can only pursue but actually never have? He says that in the movie. I'm like, yes! And by the way, he was a very strong believer. The, the happiness of the world is an illusion. The, the American dream, it is an illusion. Keeps you and I going, going, going like crazy, stressing us out, filling us with concerns and worries and ambitions. King David is saying, I'm done with that. I grew up in El Salvador, Central America. And I've experienced that. I moved to the United States seven years ago, six and a half years ago. And I've experienced, man, there's something going on. There's more stress. I just started experiencing more stress, more concern, more, you know, here than I ever experienced back home. The life back home is a little slower, a little, ch you know, it's, it's like there's not such a fixation on pursuing the American whatever, the Salvadorian dream. That doesn't exist there. There's something we are trapped in, and I want you to think about this with me. Satan has trapped us in a lie and an illusion. And he did exactly the same thing with King David. That's how everything started, First Chronicles 21. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. You see, if you know the backstory here, remember, we're talking about the backstory here, and then we're going to be translating it to the front story, the Jewish walking to Jerusalem and our wives and all that. This backstory, King David has started to reign over Israel. He's gaining power. His army is growing. And one day, Satan tempted him 
Hey, King David, you're very, you're getting very powerful, buddy. Go check your bank account. Bank account. There's a lot there now, right? And King David goes, oh man, I wanna see how powerful I am. You're getting sweet. He fell into the temptation and did a census to count how many soldiers he had in his army. God didn't like that, of course. God didn't like that in verse seven and eight. It says, God was very displeased with the census and he punished Israel. Why was he displeased with the census? I wanna to propose to you that it was because David was shifting to put his trust and his security and his identity on his power, on his success, no longer in God. God is like, no, I don't want you to count how many soldiers you have because I want you to trust that your success and your power and your victories are not going to are not going to depend on how many soldiers you have, are not going to depend on how powerful your army is, are always going to depend on me, even if you only have one soldier. If I want to give you the victory, you will have the victory, regardless of the number of soldiers you have in your army. And that's what happened, actually. He punished Israel. You know what the punishment was? 70,000 soldiers died on the spot. When David finished the census, 7,000 soldiers died on the spot. Do you agree with me? God was giving David a clear message. There's another story similar to this. Gideon, right? Going again in our army. And he's like, man, we have to have a lot of soldiers, men, warriors. And God was like, uh, Gideon, you no, know, too many. Uh, send, I don't know, 300 back home, 400 back home. And he would do it. And then Gideon would come back and, and say, God, is this enough? Is this good? God would go, now still too many soldiers. Send more home. So on and so forth. Until he only had a few to battle against a huge army. Army. God gave Gideon the victory, proving that our victory, our success, does not depend on our human strength, but in God's strength and power. Amen? So it is senseless, if you think about it with me, to focus on those things. God is like, no, I don't want your mind and your heart to be focused on that. I want to propose to you that what King David learned, thank God early in his journey as a king, because some in the Bible never learned this, even they were even, even when they were older, they were still not learning this powerful truth called humble dependence. The exchange of our ambitions for God's provision. Being able to be content, being able to be secure in God's provision. Are you putting your security? Are we putting our security in our bank accounts, in our 401ks, in our retirement funds, in our jobs, in our even in our families? Where are we putting our security in? That's a big question. Or not, share three potential signs you are not or I am not putting our security 
in the Lord. Number one, restlessness. Restlessness. You don't have peace in your heart. You can't sleep through the night. We can't stop thinking about tomorrow and trusting that God's got us. That's the first sign. Number two, irritability. Irritability. We're so stressed out. We're so consumed by our, our, our tasks and pursuing these things and our goals and all these. That by, by the time we're done with our days and come back home, we don't have any energy left for our wives and for our children. And we're irritable all the time. We give our loved ones our leftovers. And thirdly, unavailability. You never have time. We never have time for your children. We never have time for our spouses. We never have time for the Lord. We never have time for church. We're always too busy. Well, no, I have to do this. I have to do that. And I understand that sometimes these dynamics trap us. And, and it's not necessarily our fault anymore. We're just trapped there. We just have so many debts. We have so many problems. Then if we don't do all that, then we think our lives are going to fall apart completely. And so I understand. We're like in that trap. And that's why I'm talking about a trap. The Satan takes us in. We have to go out that trap. It is an illusion. Listen to this. Listen to this. Those things you think that if they are not in your life anymore, your world is going to fall apart, it's a lie. Don't worry about them. You know, I have a friend, a pastor's friend, even pastors experience this. I have a pastor friend who once shared at a pastor's conference about two things that were Keep, keeping him from sleeping through the night. Keep, keeping him so anxious and concerned and worried. And these two things were that their church was about to lose their building and that there was a big time problem with a key staff member of the church and the key and the, the staff member was thinking about leaving the church and he was like Okay, if these two things happen, this is it. The church is gonna close. My work is gonna end here. This is it. And he couldn't sleep thinking that if these two things happen, everything was going to be done. Guess what? He shared with us. He was praying that these two things ended up happening, actually. The church lost its building. This staff member left. But he learned a big lesson. The world never ended. His life never ended. Everything was okay. And even God provided in a different way. He never thought coming. He learned, okay, this thing was robbing my happiness, my, my joy. These things were robbing my sleep. These things were robbing my peace. I thought it was, everything was gonna be done and now they're gone and everything is okay. And then he said that the Lord put in his heart to say, Lord, I am done losing my sleep for anything from this world. You see, that's what King David is saying. He's saying, I'm not putting my eyes in things too great for me anymore. I am not lifting up my eyes to things that are above my head anymore. 
I am done with it. I'm going to start trusting in the Lord. I'm going to start putting my security, my confidence, and my hopes in the Lord alone. Amen? That's what King David is saying. Again, the big question for us is where are we putting our securities? Where are we putting our securities? You know, the root issue, again, is that ambitions flow from our insecurities. Ambitions flow from our need of acceptance and from our fears. Meaning, lack of dependence on the Lord. A better way, I want to propose to you this morning to live life and experience peace is what Apostle Paul told to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He said, as for the rich in this present world, by the way, if you live in the United States and you have food every day, you are in the 1% of the richest people in the world. So you are rich. This is for you and for me. As for the rich in this present world, instruct them not to be conceited and arrogant. No, to listen to this, please. Not to set their hope on the insecurity, on the uncertainty of riches, but in who? In God. Why? Because He is the one who provides richly for our needs, for our enjoyment. Amen? I want to invite us all, and I put my, myself as a freshman needing this. Let's try the better way, shall we? Let's stop pursuing our ambitions and trusting in God's provision. Let's start trusting in God's provision. That's the first shift that needs to happen. The second one, we need to switch from our demanding attitudes to an attitude of being satisfied in God. You see verses 2 and 3 in your Bibles. The psalmist continues on saying, instead, listen to this word, this is important. The word instead tells us about a shift. Amen? It's like, I, I was lifting my eyes to things that are were above my head, but I'm done with that. Instead, he says, a shift. Instead, I have calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord now and always. This is very interesting. He's given us a picture, an imagery of a unweaned or a weaned child. You see, the, the picture of a weaned child is a picture of satisfaction and contentment. How come? Well, you know, a unweaned child can get pretty demanding. <laughs> Any memories come to your minds? Can get very grumpy because they're constantly craving their mother's milk to satisfy their physical stomach. This is a picture of how we are sometimes. We die. God, I need this, I need that, I want this, I want that. Why, why God, are you taking so long? Huh? 
I want my car, I want my house, I want my new, whatever. Right. This is how we are sometimes. But the psalmist is saying, I was like this, King David is saying, but now I am like a weaned child. You know, a weaned child is a child that no longer is being breastfed, is detached from breastfeeding. Usually takes place around the age of three, three and a half, between three and 15 years old. <laughs> three, three. Actually, another very interesting detail is that the Israelites, the Jewish people have a celebration they call a on wind ceremony when their children reach three years old age, they celebrate the unweaning of the child. Because they're celebrating something very important. That is the point of the psalmist here. They're celebrating that the child has, is starting to grow into maturity. And here's the sign of maturity. The child keeps going to his or her mom not to satisfy his stomach but just to enjoy the presence of his or her mom out of love you, you see it here Tra track with me here this is important in a, a, a weaned child's love for his or her mother is no longer about him. It's about his love for his mother. It's no longer about his or her stomach. It's about true love for his or her mom. Amen? It happens in marriage sometimes too. You know, they say, if you want to be with someone, romantically speaking, because you need that person, that's not good. We want to pursue being with our spouses, not because we need them, but because we love them. Because we want to enjoy the rest of our lives with them. Just their presence, just being with them, brings full satisfaction to our hearts. Amen? So when we relate ourselves in that same way with God, that is a sign of maturity. In fact, you know, um, uh, let me put this up for you real quick. The, the, there's someone that wrote this book, Christian book, really good book. Uh, I don't remember the name. I'll email you guys the name. But he basically proposes that from scriptures, we can see at least five stages in our journey towards spiritual maturity. One of the, well, the first stage is dead then born again, then we become a spiritually infant believer, then a spiritually child believer, and so on and so forth. Now notice, when we are demanding, when we are spiritually child believers, one of the characteristics is that we are self-centered. We're focused on our needs, it's all about me. It's all about my milk. It's all about what I need. It's all our, about our demandings. But when we grow spiritually, one of the main characteristics to determine if a person is growing spiritually is that that person is no longer self-centered, is no longer demanding, is no longer grumpy. It is others-centered. It is God-centered. Amen? Now we live in a different way. Everything we do, we do it for God's glory and to serve our neighbors. 
that even sometimes to the expenses of our own sacrifice. Amen. I was talking to uh, Michael, my friend Michael, Sarah's cousin who is visiting us uh, for a couple of days. Welcome, by the way, you all. And he was telling me last night, man, he's a pastor also in Tennessee and his church was going through all these hard time. There was no money, no resources. And he's like, some people might say, well, I'm gonna stop preaching because there's no money, there's not no people, there's nothing here. He said, but I couldn't, I can't stop preaching. I just, I must, even if that service to God and to people happens to the expense of my own happiness and satisfaction in the flesh of my to the expenses of my own benefit that's what i'm talking about spiritual maturity is being focused not on me anymore not on my milk anymore but on the glory of god and the good of others amen hallelujah, hallelujah. amen that's what we're talking about here. That switch must take place in our lives. Trade our demanding attitude for an attitude of full satisfaction in the Lord. The Lord. The Lord. I'm sorry. Too excited. <laughs> to close, let me remind you this beautiful passage. Because this is important. Also, Paul learned to be satisfied in the Lord. And the word learn is key here. This is something that doesn't happen automatically. This is something that doesn't happen naturally. It's got to be learned to be content, to be satisfied with, with God's provision, with his presence in our lives. He said, I have learned, amen? I have learned in whatever situation I am to be what? To be content. Now this passage, I hope, gains a different meaning for you and for me. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance. I have learned to be satisfied in whatever circumstance. I know how to be content in abundance. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. What is the secret? Check this out. He said, I learned the secret to be content. I learned the secret to be satisfied. What is that secret? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I have learned that it doesn't matter how many soldiers I have. I have learned that if, even if I don't have my milk, even if I don't have everything I want, I can do everything, not in my strength, but in He who strengthens me. Amen. Can we say a hallelujah for that? When that shift takes place in your life and in my life, guess what's going to happen? You are going to experience calm and quietness in your soul. We are going to experience the peace of the Lord. And it is learned. We have to learn to trust in the Lord, to find calm for ourselves. That is, that is the thrust. Gotta understand that it's learned. No one's, gonna, no one's gonna do it for you. You gotta do it. Pray about it. Lord, I want to be satisfied in you. Teach me to trust in you. And the result is calm. I want it. I want to be experiencing your peace in my life. Everything. God wants us to grow from demanding spiritual infants to weaned child fully satisfied in him so we may experience his peace. Amen? So I just leave you with this. Let's start 
church, friends watching online here in person. I know we have a few families out of town today. Hope you can see this later. So important, so important. Because we all need this. Because the journey is hard. Because the journey gets heated. Because the journey is dangerous and discouraging at times. Do you need this? We need this. I need the peace of the Lord. Let's start. Let's start putting our securities, acceptance, and hopes in the Lord and learn to be fully satisfied in Him. Amen? Join me in prayer.